Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. You're listening to episode 176 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Genesis contains the famous account of Noah, the Ark, and the Great Flood. But like many passages in the Bible, this text can be understood in more than one way. So it's helpful to look at them from the perspective of reason. So what does scientific and historical evidence suggest about the interpretation of the passage? Was there a worldwide flood? Was Noah a historical person? And how should we understand this biblical text? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, what do we need to say before we begin? Well, uh, this is part two of a uh, patron's episode. Our patron, Andrew Kirk, requested the topic of the Great Flood, and uh, he's getting two episodes for, uh, for, for his request because I didn't want to shortchange this. If you haven't heard our previous episode, it was devoted to the faith perspective on the flood narrative, and this week we'll be looking at the flood narrative from the reason perspective. Great. So remind us what we concluded at the end of last week's episode. Well, from the faith perspective, we concluded that there are a range of options in terms of how to interpret the text. At one end of the spectrum, the text could allow us to hold that there was a global flood in which every detail of the passage is to be taken fully literally, including a historical Noah with every detail of his life being exact. At the other end of the spectrum, the text could be taken uh, in a purely theological way that teaches us doctrinal lessons without requiring a historical flood. It could essentially be a, a big parable, in other words, and on this view, Noah would not be a historical figure. In the middle, we have the possibility that there was a local flood according to which some details of the text uh, do uh, convey historical information, but others should not be pressed. This includes details about the life of the patriarch Noah, who would have been a real person, even if some of the details about him were supplied and weren't meant to be taken fully literally. The church has not weighed in definitively on any of these options. So from the faith perspective, each of these views, at least in principle, is uh, is possible. And so um, we can't say which of them is most likely until we get input from the reason perspective. And I should point out that at the moment, I'm not endorsing any of those perspectives, neither am I commenting on which are more likely than the others. I'm just saying that none of them have been completely ruled out at this point. All right, so this week we'll be looking at the flood from the reason perspective. So what will we be considering? Mostly the same questions that we looked at last time from the faith perspective, whether there is evidence for a worldwide flood, whether Noah was a historical person, and whether rainbows did or did not appear before the flood. In previous episodes, we've covered the other passages in early Genesis. How does how does what we said then inform our discussion today? Well, we covered uh, other early passages in Genesis back in episodes 119, 120, and 121 on the Young Earth Hypothesis, where we looked at the question of whether the faith perspective requires an Earth that's old, only a few thousand years old. Based on several factors, including the teaching of the Church's magisterium, we concluded that it didn't, that the Christian faith is compatible with both a young earth and an old earth. We then turned to the reason perspective to see what the scientific evidence says, and we concluded that it points to an old earth. At the time, we pointed out that if he chose, God could suspend or bypass the ordinary laws of nature and create an earth that looks old from the reason perspective, even though it's actually young. 
And that's true. God can do miracles, although it would bring into question his goodness and truthfulness if he's planting evidence of an old earth and misleading us about its age. But our point wasn't that God couldn't do miracles that make the earth look young. Instead, the point was that the evidence available from the reason perspective points to an old earth. If you want to believe in a young earth, that's fine, but it's not the reason perspective that's getting you there. It's something motivated by one's theological convictions. And in principle, the same applies here. We've already concluded that the faith perspective doesn't require a global flood. The Christian faith is compatible with both the idea that one happened and that one didn't. Uh, now we're going to be looking at the evidence from the, from what the reason perspective has to say. And like before, it's possible that God could do miracles that would account for all the evidence we see so that what we find from the reason perspective isn't accurate. But again, the key point to remember is that if you reject the reason perspective and what it would lead us to believe, it isn't reason-based evidence that's leading you to do that. It's one's personal theological convictions. So um, please keep the reason-based evidence and what one believes theologically distinct as we go through this. Yes, God could do miracles that could account for all the evidence we're going to see, but that isn't the question. The question is, what does the evidence of reason suggest? Before we get to the reason perspective, it is very important I take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Cher W., Daniel C., Father Jeff H., Arthur D., and Jason C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. And by Fearvento Law, PLLC, specializing in adult guardianships and conservatorships, probate, and estate planning matters. Accepting clients throughout Michigan, taking into account your individual health care, financial, and religious needs. Visit fearventolaw.com. F I O R V E N T O law.com. So, Jimmy, what arguments, apart from the biblical ones, do global flood supporters use? One of the most common arguments is that there are various flood stories told around the world in different cultures. Uh, the idea is that they're all based on traditions stemming from Noah's global flood. Usually, the idea is that they're based on traditions passed down from Noah's family that became distorted with time. Sometimes advocates of a global flood will refer to this as telephone mythology, after the children's game Telephone, where a story becomes distorted with retellings. That view assumes that Noah and his family were the only people to survive the flood, but I should point out, for the sake of completeness, that the traditions of a global flood could also stem from that same flood, but not from Noah's family. That would be the case, for example, if God preserved other people alive elsewhere in the world, even though the Bible doesn't mention them because the biblical author didn't know about them. And what do you make of this argument? One of the things that we've talked about in previous episodes is that it is possible for traditions to be passed down through very long periods of time. This is the case, for example, with astronomical traditions. We've discussed how it looks like the legends connected with Ursa Major, the Great Bear constellation, actually go back at least 15,000 years, because the same variations on those legends are found both in Asia and the Americas. And that suggests that they were being circulated in Asia before people started crossing the Bering Land Bridge and began populating the Americas. Another example that we've seen are the legends connected with the Pleiades star cluster, often referred to as the Seven Sisters. Uh, the thing is, you can only see six stars in the cluster today, but there is a seventh that used to be visible but is currently hidden. 
That suggests that the cultures which refer to the Pleiades as the Seven Sisters, which are found all over the place, are drawing on a memory that goes back thousands of years to when the seventh star was visible, perhaps a hundred thousand years ago. So I'm not at all opposed to the idea that at least certain types of traditions can be passed down and preserved for very long periods of time. And would the flood story be one of those traditions? I don't think so. At least it's not obvious that it would be. In the case of astronomical traditions, you have a great big reminder staring you in the face every night. And people in the ancient world spent a lot of time looking up at the night sky, much more than we do. Every night you would see the Great Bear and the Seven Sisters, and that would serve as a prompt, both for you to remember the legends and to teach them to your kids. So it's easier to see how an astronomical tradition would be constantly reinforced by everyday experience, making it easier to see how such a tradition would survive. But a global flood that occurred in the past would not have that kind of daily visible reminder. As a result, it wouldn't get the same type of reinforcement and we wouldn't expect it to survive across tens of thousands of years. Of course, global flood advocates typically hold that Noah was much more recent than that. Uh, in the chronology developed by the Anglo-Irish Archbishop James Usher in the 1600s, Noah's flood took place in 2349 BC. So the tradition would only need to be preserved for around 1300 years before it was recorded in the Bible. And how does that square with the historical archaeological record? Not very well. Uh, for example, 2349 BC was toward the end of Egypt's Old Kingdom. Uh, the pyramids had already been built, and they do not show damage from a global flood. And the reigning pharaoh in that year was the 6th century monarch, or sorry, 6th dynasty monarch named Teddy. Uh, he reigned for many years, in fact, after 2349, and had many successors before the end of the Sixth Dynasty in the Old Kingdom. Of course, global flood advocates could push the flood further back to before Egypt's Old Kingdom, or pre even its pre-dynastic period, but the farther it gets pushed back, the less likely it would be for the tradition of it occurring to survive. Some critics of the global flood view have pointed out that the flood stories in different parts of the world disagree on the details. For example, they don't all refer to a family like Noah's surviving, but maybe just a couple people or even one person or maybe a much larger group of people. And also many of them don't record animals being brought on board whatever vessel weathered the flood. The vessels are different and the length of the flood changes from a few days to many years. In some stories, people survive without any vessel and just climb high mountains. And sometimes the legend just describes a big flood without claiming it covered the whole of the land. What do you make of this as an argument against a global flood? I'm not impressed with it because you'd expect such variations in detail as the tradition gets retold. What's important is that the flood stories preserve the gist, the core of the story that a big flood happened, not that all of the details are the same. And all of the big flood stories do preserve the gist of a big flood happened. Does that mean you find the flood stories from different cultures convincing as evidence of a global flood? No, because there are other possible explanations for these stories. Uh, first, humans tend to live near water. In fact, they almost always have done so in history. And that means that many of the places where humans live will experience periodic floods. And anywhere that has periodic floods will occasionally have a really big one, and those big ones will be remembered and passed down in local traditions. And some people would survive those floods using a boat, a raft, a log, or by climbing to higher ground, just like in the flood stories. And while weathering a big flood, some would look out and see water all around them, and when passing on the story to their children would talk about how the water covered the whole land. And so even if there was no global flood, you'd still expect exactly the kind of legends we have to crop up in various places around the world. So 
flood stories from around the world don't prove the existence of a worldwide flood. Instead, they prove the existence of floods worldwide. It looks like the flood stories in different cultures would be consistent either with a single great global flood or with a bunch of smaller local floods. Is there a way to tell which possibility the flood stories point to? There is, and it's by looking at where the stories crop up. We'd expect one of two different patterns to appear in the folklore, depending on whether the stories were produced by a global flood or by various local ones. If they were to be explained by a single global flood, you would expect the stories to appear everywhere, even in cultures that don't live in areas where floods occur. But if they're due to local flooding, you'd expect them to appear in those cultures that live in flood-prone regions. And which patterns do we see in the folklore? The latter. The flood stories primarily appear in areas where floods happen regularly. According to Trimper Longman and John Walton in their book, The Lost World of the Flood, There are many flood stories from around the world, but mostly from places with a high probability and experience of frequent floods. A bit further on, they quote the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible as saying, We know that numerous peoples have no flood legend in their liter literature. Flood stories are almost entirely lacking in Africa, occur only occasionally in Europe, and are absent in many parts of Asia. They are widespread in America, Australia, and the islands of the Pacific. So flood stories do not appear everywhere. They appear in certain cultures, and these cultures tend to live in areas where flooding actually takes place. Uh, that pattern is more consistent with the stories being due to periodic local floods rather than a single global flood. Besides folklore, what do advocates of a global flood point to as evidence? One of the key things they appeal to is sometimes called flood geology. Uh, that is the geological evidence that they think is best explained by a global flood. Back in the 1800s, there was really a great deal of interesting discussion about flood geology that was taking place as part of the development of the modern science of geology, particularly in Great Britain. And you can read about that in histories of science. Flood geology at the time, very respectable, very much under discussion. But ultimately, as they started accumulating more geological evidence, the great majority of scientists, including Christian ones, concluded that the geological evidence was not best explained by a global flood. However, there are still some, particularly in the young earth community, that do support flood geology as an explanation for what we see in the geological record. In episodes 119, 120, and 121, we looked at the evidence for the young earth view, and you concluded that the scientific evidence does not support it. We won't be revisiting that question here, but what kinds of geological evidence do people point to today for the idea of a global flood? The website AnswersInGenesis.org offers a handy summary in the form of six pieces of what they take to be major lines of evidence. We'll have a link to their webpage so that you can read them for yourself. Here's the first thing they cite as evidence for a global flood. Evidence 1. Fossils of sea creatures high above sea level due to the ocean waters having flooded over the continents. We find fossils of sea creatures in rock layers that cover all the continents. For example, most of the rock layers in the walls of Grand Canyon, more than a mile above sea level, contain marine fossils. Fossilized shellfish are even found in the Himalayas. It's true that we find fossils of sea creatures in rocks high above today's sea level across different continents. That's quite accurate. In fact, as a boy, I grew up in the Boston Mountains, which are the highest part of the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas, and I would go out onto the dirt road we lived on, and in the red dirt, I would pick up little fossils of sea creatures. So it was obvious that the Boston Mountains and the Ozarks in Arkansas had previously been underwater a long time ago. So that's all true. However, it doesn't support the idea of a global flood rather than the conventional geological alternative. The conventional geological account holds that due to continental drift, 
the continental plates bump into each other, and that results in one plate going under another and lifting it up so that regions that used to be underwater are now above water. As a result, finding fossils on mountains doesn't tell you whether the fossilized creatures were washed up by a flood or raised up by the action of continental plates. This is a piece of evidence that's consistent with both theories, both the flood geology theory and the standard geology theory. Now, here's the next piece of evidence they cite. Evidence 2. Rapid Burial of Plants and Animals We find extensive fossil graveyards and exquisitely preserved fossils. For example, billions of nautiloid fossils are found in a layer within the red wall limestone of Grand Canyon. This layer was deposited catastrophically by a massive flow of sediment, mostly lime sand. The chalk and coal beds of Europe and the United States, and the fish, ichthyosaurs, insects, and other fossils all around the world testify of catastrophic destruction and burial. It's true that we do have fossil graveyards where many fossils of ancient plants and animals are found. In geology, these are known as Konservat Lagerstata. Lagerstata is German for storage place, so a bunch of fossils are found or stored in one place, and a conservat Lagerstata then means a storage place for fossils that conserves them intact rather than just collecting a big pile of disarticulated bones or something. Perhaps the most famous uh, conservat lagerstata is the Burgess Shale in British Columbia, Canada, which contains life forms from the Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago. The existence of these fossil graveyards shows that a bunch of plants and animals did die together and were preserved together. But this is also consistent with both theories. They could have died and been preserved together because of a global catastrophe like a great flood, or they could have died and been preserved together by a local catastrophe, such as a local flood or an underwater mudslide. So again, it's consistent with both views. Evidence 3. Rapidly deposited sediment layers spread across vast areas. We find rock layers that can be traced all the way across continents, even between continents, and physical features in those strata indicate they were deposited rapidly. For example, the Tapeats sandstone and Redwall limestone of Grand Canyon can be traced across the entire United States up into Canada and even across the Atlantic Ocean to England. The chalk beds of England, the White Cliffs of Dover, can be traced across Europe into the Middle East and are also found in the Midwest of the United States and in Western Australia. Inclined sloping layers within the Co Coconino sandstone of Grand Canyon are testimony to 10,000 cubic miles of sand being deposited by huge water currents within days. It's true that sedimentary rock layers can span large distances across continents, but that doesn't tell us that they were deposited within days. All it tells us is that the sediments were deposited, not how long it took. Having a big field of sediments deposited is consistent, both with them being rapidly deposited and with them being deposited slowly. Think, for example, of all the sediments that are being slowly deposited right now in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, washing down through the Mississippi River and so forth, and other rivers. Well, eventually those sediments will turn into one big rock layer that could then be uplifted by continental action. So big layers of sedimentary rock don't tell us how fast the sediments were deposited. Also, Answers in Genesis seems to be mistaken about how far these regions extend. It may be true that the chalk beds in uh, southeastern England stretch into Europe, but the island of Great Britain used to be part of Europe, uh, being connected to the mainland by a now sunken region known as Doggerland, which we will be talking about in a future episode. But Answers in Genesis seems to be exaggerating when it says that these regions of sedimentary rock stretch across continents. Geologist Stephen Mosher writes in The Lost World of the Flood, Many sedimentary rock layers cover vast areas of the continents, but no single layer covers an entire continent from one end to the other, as flood geologists claim. 
In fact, detailed mapping shows that rock layers overlap one another like leaves piled up on a lawn. Rather than finding evidence of one massive deluge, mainstream geologists find abundant evidence of multiple periods of rising and falling sea level that changed by as much as 400 feet higher or lower than at present. And even if sedimentary rock layers did cross continental boundaries, that wouldn't tell you anything about how fast they were deposited. All it would suggest is that the two continents were joined when the sediments were laid down, and mainstream geology holds that the continents were in fact joined at various points in time. Back to Answers in Genesis. Evidence 4. Sediment Transported Long Distances we find that the sediments in these widespread, wa rapidly deposited rock layers had to be eroded from distant sources and carried long distances by fast-moving water. For example, the sand of the Coconino sandstone of Grand Canyon, Arizona, had to be eroded and transported from the northern portion of what is now the United States and Canada. Furthermore, water, water current indicators, such as ripple marks, preserved in rock layers, show that for, quote, 300 million years, end quote, water currents were consistently flowing from northeast to southwest across all of North and South America, which of course is only possible over weeks during a global flood. It's true that sand in the Coconino sandstone of the Grand Canyon was transported a long distance to get there, but once again, this doesn't tell us anything about how long it took to get there. It could have come rapidly in a flood, or it could have come slowly over long periods of time by the action of rivers and wind. There are also problems with the claims being made here. As Stephen Mosher writes, The deposition of sand across continents pertains to flood geologists' study of one particular rock formation in the Grand Canyon, the Coconino Sandstone. Mainstream geologists interpret bedding structures and small animal tracks in the rock layers as representing an ancient sand dune desert environment. The unit is up to 600 feet thick in the Grand Canyon and 1,000 feet thick to the south in Arizona. Sand particles appear to have been transported by rivers to the place of deposition from a source of older bedrock some 600 miles to the west and north in present-day Utah and Wyoming. Having desert rock deposited in the middle of the flood is a problem for flood geology, so flood geologists interpret the sand to have been transported by swift currents of 2 to 4 miles per hour under deep water. To fit in the flood year time frame, the Coconino Formation would have, to be, would have had to have been deposited in a matter of days requiring a mass of sand hundreds of feet thick and hundreds of miles wide to be moving at several miles per hour across thousands of square miles. This catastrophic deposition scenario does not adequately explain how dainty animal tracks could be abundantly preserved in the bedding. And that's right. You would not have uh, preserved animal tracks in this layer of sediment if it were shifted hundreds of miles in a short time frame as part of a massive underwater sediment flow. Back to answers in Genesis. Evidence 5. Rapid or no erosion between strata. We find evidence of rapid erosion or even of no erosion between rock layers. Flat knife edge boundaries between rock layers indicate continuous deposition of one layer after another with no time for erosion. For example, there is no evidence of any missing millions of years of erosion in the flat boundary between two well-known layers of Grand Canyon, the Coconino Sandstone and the Hermit Formation. Another impressive example of flat boundaries at Grand Canyon is the Redwall Limestone and the strata beneath it. Again, we're looking at things in the Grand Canyon, which should raise a little bit of suspicion about, do we really have any good evidence they can point to, or is this just one anomalous site that they're, they're looking to for evidence for this position? In any event, conventional geology explains what we see here. Moshier writes, there should be no evidence of erosion or exposure to air between or within sedimentary rock layers if they were de deposited in rapid succession beneath the floodwater. However, contacts showing evidence for erosion or non-deposition between layers in successions of sedimentary rock, called unconformities, are common on every continent. 
flood geologists cite knife edge contacts between formations in the Grand Canyon as evidence of continuous and uninterrupted sedimentation from top to bottom of the rock sequence. They recognize only one major unconformity in the Grand Canyon sequence, known as the Great Unconformity, representing the beginning of flood deposition. However, there are at least 19 documented unconformities in the 5,000-foot sequence of sedimentary rock in the Grand Canyon. Two such formation contacts feature spectacular buried channels that formed after the underlying units were deposited and their upper surfaces were eroded. Later, the channels were filled with sediment from the overlying formation. Mainstream geologists consider this as evidence of long-term sea level rise and fall across the continents, much the way sea level rose and fell hundreds of meters several times over the past two million years during the Ice Age. One of those formations exhibiting erosion on its upper surface is the Red Wall Limestone. Along with the channels, we find ancient sinkholes and caves that eventually collapsed or were filled with sediment from the overlying formation. Caves form in solid limestone as fresh groundwater dissolves the soluble rock over thousands of years. Evidence of unconformities and ancient caves negates the flood geology interpretation of rapid deposition with no slow or gradual erosion. So there is more than one explanation for the claimed knife-edged contacts between the different layers in the Grand Canyon. They could be due to different layers rolling in and being rapidly deposited during a flood, or they could be due to a long, slow period of erosion after which a new layer comes in. If the latter's the case, we would expect to see some irregularities, and that is what we do see with places where caves eroded out and then sinkholes collapsed, and the formation of the caves themselves out of the limestone rock by the slow action of water dissolving the rock over thousands of years points away from the rapid formation theory. Finally, here's Answers in Genesis's last major piece of evidence. Evidence 6. Many strata lay down in rapid succession. Rocks do not normally bend. They break because they are hard and brittle. But in many places we find whole sequences of strata that were bent without fracturing, indicating that all the rock layers were rapidly deposited and folded while still wet and pliable before final hardening. For example, the Tapeats sandstone in Grand Canyon is folded at a right angle, 90 degrees, without evidence of breaking. Yet this folding could only have occurred after the rest of the layers had been deposited, supposedly over, quote, 480 million years, end quote, while the tapied sandstone remained wet and pliable. Here's Moshir's response. Another problem is the thick series of sedimentary rock layers that are folded with bends in the strata of as much as 90 degrees. Because they do not observe evidence of brittle fracture in the layers, flood geologists claim that bending occurred after the layers accumulated in rapid succession, but before the sediment hardened into so solid rock. In fact, mainstream geologists have reported on abundant evidence of brittle fracture and slippage along surfaces between layers in these rocks. This kind of deformation can occur in hard rock if high levels of stress are applied to the rock over long periods of time. So deformations like this can occur in sedimentary rock layers when the rock is subjected to stress for a long period. And we do, in fact, see the kind of brittle fractures and slippages that we would expect to see based on conventional geology. So we've looked at the six key pieces of evidence for a global flood presented by Answers in Genesis and seen that conventional geology also explains them. Now let's look at the other side of the issue. What arguments should we consider against the idea of there being a global flood? There are several, and we can put them into broad categories. Some concern the geological record, some concern the flood itself, some concern the conditions aboard the ark, and some concern the creatures that survived the flood. All right, let's look at the geological record. What do people argue points away from the idea of a global flood? This is a very broad area, and we won't be able to go into all the types of geological evidence that convinced mainstream geologists that there was no global flood. Uh, and remember, at one point, proving such a flood was a key goal in the early days of flood geology. But eventually, the geological community concluded the evidence just didn't point that way. 
However, we will look at one aspect of the geological record that's fairly easy to understand, even for non-specialists. It's the fact that fossils of similar kinds of life form are found in different layers. And can you give examples of that? Yeah, uh, people will have heard about different kinds of extinct creatures. Uh, conventional paleontology holds that the dinosaurs lived in a period known as the Mesozoic era, which ran from about 250 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. And the Mesozoic is divided into three periods. The earliest is known as the Triassic period. The middle is known as the Jurassic period. And the latest and most recent is known as the Cretaceous period. The reason the Mesozoic era is divided into those periods is because we find different kinds of fossils in the rock layers. In the lower rock layers associated with the Triassic, we find animals like the Cellophysis, which was one of the first dinosaurs. It was a small bipedal carnivore. Then, in the middle rock layers associated with the Jurassic, we find animals like the Allosaurus, which was a much bigger bipedal carnivore. And then, in the higher levels associated with the Cretaceous, we find animals like the Tyrannosaurus rex, which was an even larger bipedal carnivore that also had tiny freaky arms. <laughs> um, each of these creatures are two-legged meat eaters, but of different sizes, and we find them in different layers. And what's the problem with finding the bones of these creatures in different layers of rock? If Cellophyces, Allosauruses, and T-Rexes were all living at the same time before the flood, then they all would have died at the same time when the flood struck. And as a result, we should find the bones of these different species jumbled up together in the same rock layers. But we don't. We find them in separate rock layers with Cellophyces in the bottom layers, Allosauruses in the middle layers, and T-Rexes in the top layers of the, associated with the Mesozoic era. Could someone propose that there was a natural sorting process that would result in the bones being deposited in different layers? I can imagine someone suggesting something like that, like maybe, okay, the bigger dinos were heavier, so they would sink down in the mud and they would be found at the lowest levels. But that's not what we see. We see the opposite. With the lightweight Cellophyces on the bottom, the heavier Allosauruses above them, and the super heavy T. rexes on top. Well, what if someone claimed that the shorter dinosaurs would have drowned first as the floodwaters rose, and that's why they'd be in the lower rock layers? Uh, that won't work because for the floodwaters to cover the highest mountains in the 150 days that the water was rising, they would have had to rise at a rate of more than 100 feet per day. And none of these dinosaurs were anywhere close to 100 feet tall, so they all would have died on the same day, the first day of the flood, and we should find their bones jumbled together. And this isn't just a problem for the dinosaurs. It's all the animals. If you go back into the periods before the Mesozoic, you find smaller and simpler animals as you go further back. Why should the smallest and simplest animals be at the bottom if they were living at the, in the rock strata, if they were living at the same time as all the other animals? And why are all the big mammals in layers that come after the Mesozoic if they were all living at the same time as the dinosaurs. What about other creatures other than animals? Do we see the same kind of pattern with plants? Yeah, the same thing also happens with plants. For example, you will not find evidence of flowering plants or angiosperms as they're known before the Mesozoic era, and they don't take off until you reach the Cretaceous period. It's clear that there is a sorting by layers going on here, but the sorting is based on the complexity and type of the life form, with simple sea life in the lower layers, then simple land life, including plants, then simpler land animals, then bigger massive land animals like the dinosaurs, 
and then they all disappear and mammals take over in the uppermost layers. That's not what you would expect to see in the rock layers if they were all laid down during a single year of a global flood and all the creatures, and plants and animals, had been living together and died at once. Aren't there reports of anomalies in the geological record, like people finding human footprints next to dinosaur ones? There are, uh, but these are open to interpretation. The most famous such site is Paluxy River in Texas, but there are big problems with the claims regarding this site. Uh, for one thing, there aren't normal human footprints. Wikipedia summarizes, Some claimed that some footprints were made of, by mythological giant humans who lived at the same time as the dinosaurs who created the other tracks. Though there are some that still cite the trackways as evidence against the geological time scale, the general consensus is that all of the human tracks were either fake or interpreted incorrectly. Some of the tracks were fake, carved by locals to sell during the Great Depression. These footprints do not represent the way human footprints would look in mud. They also do not accurately reflect the changes in the way giant humans would walk as a result of their size. Other footprints were genuine tracks, but showed features inconsistent with human footprints. In 1986, Glenn Kubin conducted research on the trackways. He founded that most tracks formed a wide V at the end and showed grooves in places that were not consistent with those in a human footprint. Kubin determined that the tracks were made by bipedal dinosaurs with three toes. These particular tracks showed the dinosaur walking on the soles of its feet rather than on its toes, as is usually found in tracks. Evidence based in human anatomy also refutes the claim that the footprints are of human origin. The foot length measurements were used to calculate approximate heights of the humans. The pace and stride lengths do not match these calculated heights, making it highly unlikely that the tracks are human in origin. The measurements do fit the known values for bipedal dinosaurs. So the Paluxy River trackway isn't good evidence of humans and dinosaurs living at the same time. And even if you find anomalies that could be interpreted that way, it doesn't overturn the fact that over and over again we have fossils of different plants and animals in different layers, sequenced in ways that a global flood would not explain, but that evolutionary theory does explain. The evidence on that is massive and worldwide and could not, be inter could not be overturned by a handful of unusual sites that are open to more than one interpretation. You said some of the evidence we need to look at concerns the flood itself. One of the things we should cover is how high the flood waters went if it was a global flood. What would that involve? The tallest mountain in Israel is Mount Hermon, which rises 7,336 feet above sea level. But the Israelites knew of even taller mountains. Genesis 8.4 refers to the ark coming to rest on the mountains of Ararat, which has led many people to say that the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. But the situation is more complicated than that. Mountains of Ararat is plural, not singular. In the World Biblical Commentary, Gordon Wenham writes, On the mountains of Ararat does not mean on a mountain called Ararat, but on the mountains in the area called Ararat. Ararat is the Hebrew term for Urartu, a kingdom north of Assyria, Assyria, later called Armenia, now part of eastern Turkey, southern Russia, and northwestern Iran. Various mountains in Armenia have been identified with the one on which the ark landed. Early Jewish tradition called them the mountains of Kardu, apparently Jebel Judi, south of Lake Van. Other suggestions include Great Ararat, called by locals the Mountain of Noah, and Little Ararat. Great Ararat and Little Ararat are two cones of a compound volcano in Armenia that is often used as a symbol of Armenian nationalism, much to the annoyance of the Turks. The tallest peak, as you would expect, is Great Ararat, which is 16,864 feet tall, or basically 17,000 feet tall. However, there are even taller mountains elsewhere in the world. The tallest 100 mountains are in countries the Israelites had no contact with, like China, Pakistan, Nepal, India, Bhutan, 
Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. So the Israelites really didn't know about those. But when it comes to the height of the waters, Genesis 7 states, And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. 15 cubits is about 23 feet. So uh, we have the text stating that the mountains were covered by water up to that depth. Does that mean all the mountains in the world, like the text would suggest? Not necessarily. It depends on whether God used the background of the biblical author and what mountains he was aware of, or whether God infused the author with special knowledge he had no way of knowing otherwise. While God can give people infused knowledge, as is the case with the prophets, most of the time he uses the biblical author's knowledge and cultural background when he inspires scripture. Since that's what God usually does, the text would most naturally be understood in terms of the mountains a Hebrew author would have been aware of, such as the peak of Great Ararat. But just for the sake of completeness, we'll also consider the possibility that he was aware of the highest mountains there are, including Mount Everest, which is 29,000 feet tall. Under both possibilities, then, how much water are we talking about? I ran the math, which is a rather interesting exercise, uh, and I won't bore you with the details or dazzle you with hugely large numbers that are almost impossible to keep track of in an audio format. Um, instead, I'll express how much water was needed for the Great Flood in terms of Earth ocean volumes. That is, how much water was needed to cover the mountains compared to all the water currently in Earth's oceans. Basically, to cover Great Ararat to a height of 15 cubits, or 23 feet, you'd need three times as much water as is currently in the Earth's oceans, or three ocean volumes. And to cover Mount Ararat to, to, and to cover Mount Everest to a height of 15 cubits, or 23 feet, you'd need 4.4 times as much water as is currently in the oceans, or 4.4 ocean volumes. Where would all that water have come from? Genesis indicates that there were two sources. In Genesis 7, we read, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heaven were opened, and rain fall, fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So the two sources were all the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven. One water source from below and one from above. Now, according to a view you commonly hear in some circles, the Israelites conceptualized the universe as being filled with a cosmic ocean, with the earth being a little air-filled pocket within that ocean. The idea is that the earth was supposed to be thought of as a flat disk, or flat surface at least, with waters below it, and covered by a bowl-shaped dome, a kind of upside-down bowl, known as the firmament, which kept out the waters above the dome. Unless God opened the windows of heaven in the firmament to let the waters in, resulting in rain. Now, I don't deny that the Hebrew Bible uses language that could suggest that picture of the world, but there's a question of how literally it was intended. I mean, the Israelites were an agricultural society, so they knew very well that rain comes from clouds. If, if As they were growing their crops, they're watching the sky for, are the clouds coming when we need them to water the crops? In fact, the Bible refers to the fact that rain comes from the clouds, as in Proverbs 16.15, which says, In the light of a king's face there is life, and his favor is like the clouds that bring the spring rain. So the Israelites knew rain comes from the clouds, and that suggests the windows of heaven language isn't to be taken literally. It's a metaphor. Uh, 
And we have other passages in the Old Testament that refer to earth being supported by pillars, not floating on a cosmic ocean. I thus have questions about the cosmic ocean model. But whether that's to be taken literally or not, Genesis does indicate that water came from both above and below. If the global flood view would require between 3 and 4.4 times as much water as is currently in the oceans, where do supporters of the global flood view think that water was stored? A view that was proposed by Henry Morris in 1961 has become known as the canopy theory. The idea is that before the flood, Earth used to be covered by a canopy of water high above the surface. Uh, the water may have been made of vapor, ice, or liquid water, and it collapsed at the time of the flood, supplying much of the water that was involved in the event. Supporters of the canopy model appeal to Genesis 1, where it says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and separated the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. So supporters of this idea identify the canopy with the firmament. What is a firmament? In English, it's become a virtual synonym for the sky. I mean, if you refer to the firmament, that's the only thing a typical English speaker is going to think about. But originally, it referred to something that's firm, a strong or solid structure. In Hebrew, the word that Genesis uses is rakia, which means an extended surface or a solid expanse. That's where the idea of the sky as a solid upside-down bowl comes from. And you can see how it could be linked to the canopy theory, especially if the canopy was made of solid ice. What do you make of the canopy theory? I don't think it's very successful, and a lot of global flood advocates don't think it is either. Uh, many supporters of the global flood view don't buy the canopy theory, and I think there are good reasons for that. First, right there in Genesis 1, we have the stars being created on the fourth day, and they were visible. But if Earth was surrounded by a canopy of water, they wouldn't be visible. They're far too distant and faint. Uh, some canopy theorists acknowledge that we wouldn't be able to see the stars through a vapor canopy or a liquid water canopy, but they may argue that we could see them through an ice canopy. I'm doubtful because the ice would have to be way clearer and more pristine than the ice we find here on Earth. Um, a second problem is that unless God was miraculously sustaining the canopy, it would be really hard to make sense of it from a physics perspective. An ice canopy shouldn't be stable and should collapse due to the gravitational forces involved. A liquid canopy shouldn't exist because it's too cold in the upper atmosphere or in space for water to remain liquid. And a vapor canopy would be more understandable, but if it was thick enough to contain an ocean's worth or more of water, it would block out the stars. Third, the biblical evidence does not support the canopy theory. Uh, Genesis 1 says that God called the firmament heaven or sky, and obviously heaven and the sky were still there after the flood. And the Bible speaks of the firmament using the word rakia as being around after in the Israelites' own day after the flood, such as in this passage from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Or this passage from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament. So both of these passages indicate that the firmament was still around after the flood. And since the latter speaks of angels praising God in his firmament, it suggests that the firmament should not be understood as a literal physical bowl over the earth. That's just a poetic way of referring to heaven where the angels are. 
If the canopy theory doesn't look good, what about the waters below, the fountains of the deep that the flood narrative refers to? Here's where we come to a really fascinating scientific idea that has only recently been proposed. There's a mineral called ringwoodite, and it can absorb water. A recent study of some ringwoodite that got coughed up by a volcano suggests that there could be quite a bit of water underground. As Nova reports, if all the ringwoodite in the transition zone below ground is as damp as the samples that Jacob Summit and his team detected, that layer would hold three times as much water as all of the Earth's oceans combined. In other words, the ringwoodite discovery could quadruple the amount of water found on Earth. A blue planet, indeed. So it's actually possible that Earth could have enough water to cover all the mountains if it were all brought to the surface. Of course, God would need to do a miracle that would suck the Earth's interior dry for that to happen, but the water might actually be there. You said some of the evidence we need to look at concerns the conditions aboard the Ark. What do we need to say here? One of the questions people often have about the flood narrative is whether the Ark could have really held all the animals that Noah is supposed to have carried. Uh, Genesis tells us the dimensions of the Ark, so we can easily calculate its size. Before I get to that, though, I want to address the question of how Noah would have gotten all the animals into the ark. You might wonder, how is it possible for Noah without a massive team of zoological experts to go out and capture animals from all over the world and bring them back to the ark? I mean, that would be a massive undertaking, and it would have been totally impossible in the ancient world. But the good news is that Noah didn't have to. Because according to the biblical text, God said, Two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. So Noah didn't have to conduct a worldwide safari and capture all the animals. Instead, God did a miracle and brought them to him, so we don't need to worry about the how did he get the animals problem. Then let's turn to whether they could all fit on the ark. How big was it? According to Genesis, the ark was 30 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall, being divided into three decks. So each deck was 10 cubits tall. A cubit is around 18 inches, or one and a half feet. So that converts to 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. And if you run the math, Bearing in mind that the Ark had three decks, it turns out that the Ark's total floor space was about 100,000 square feet. For comparison, that's about the equivalent of two American football fields. So each of the three decks of the Ark would have been about two-thirds as big as a football field. Is it possible to fit two of every species of land animal in two football fields? Not remotely. And global flood advocates are aware of that. There are literally millions of species when you count small things like insects, and there is no way you could fit millions of species onto the ark. So global flood advocates have a, another proposal. They restrict the number of types of animals that Noah would have taken. On the website for Ken Ham's Ark Encounter, we read, Was every kind of animal on the ark? The Bible states that Noah's cargo was limited to land-dwelling animals in which was the breath of life. This clearly excludes fish and other sea creatures, and it probably excludes the insects and other invertebrates. They're correct that Noah was not told to bring fish and sea creatures, and in Hebrew culture, invertebrates were not typically regarded as having the breath of life since they don't visibly breathe. You know, in invertebrates include insects like grasshoppers and stuff. You look at one, it doesn't seem to be breathing. So there's a case that Noah wouldn't have taken them. That raises its own problem, though, because land-dwelling invertebrates still need dry surfaces to live on and places to get food for a year. Bees, for example, will drown in water, and they need flowers to get food. So I don't know how bees and all the numerous other invertebrates would have survived the year of the flood if they weren't on the ark and if the mountains were all covered with water. There's also another problem, which is that Ark Encounter has quoted the text selectively. Uh, 
they quoted in the passage we just heard from Genesis 7.15, which mentions animals with the breath of life. But if you read earlier in the text, at Genesis 6.20, we find, Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come to you to keep them alive. The key part of that for our present purposes is the reference to Noah preserving two of every creeping thing of the ground. Creeping thing in Hebrew includes small invertebrate animals like ants and beetles that don't visibly breathe but do visibly creep along the ground. The biblical author understood creeping things to include those. And so there is a basis in the text for saying that Noah was told to take invertebrates. But just to be generous, let's assume Noah only took the land-dwelling mammals, birds, and reptiles. And how many species of those are there? About 25,000. So Noah would need to take 50,000 animals. Actually, it'd be more than that because Noah was also told to take seven pairs of every animal that was considered ritually clean. So that would mean 14 animals for each clean species instead of just two. But let's stick with the number of 50,000 just to keep it simple. If they had 100,000 square feet of floor space on the ark, and 50,000 animals to keep alive. That would average out to only two square feet per animal. And that's a problem because a lot of animals take up way more than two square feet. But the problem is actually worse because Noah also had to bring enough food to keep the animals alive for a year. God specifically tells Noah to take food for the animals. In Genesis 6.12, uh, sorry, 6.21 we read, also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. So if Noah had 50,000 animals on the ark, you'd have to not only fit the animal itself in, but all the food that the animal would need to eat for a year into the ark with just two square feet of floor space on average for each species or for each animal. That's especially a problem when it comes to feeding the carnivores, which need to eat other animals. And the animals that will be used for food then need to be kept alive with their own plant-based food stores until they're eaten by the carnivores. So it would involve more than 50,000 animals in order to keep the carnivores alive. Ultimately, the situation is untenable enough that global flood supporters frequently don't think that Noah took two animals of every mammal, bird, and reptile species. So what do they propose instead? Uh, that he took a pair from a broader zoological classification than species. On the Ark Encounter website, we read, Was every species on the Ark? No, species is a term used in the modern classification system. The Bible uses the term kind. The created kind was a much broader category than the modern term of classification, species. The biblical concept of created kind probably most closely corresponds to the family level in current taxonomy. A good rule of thumb is that if two things can breed together, then they are of the same created kind. It is a bit more complicated, but this is a good quick measure of a kind. There can be tremendous amount of variation within a created kind. For example, various types of dogs, such as wolves, dingoes, coyotes, jackals, and domestic dogs, can often breed with one another. When dogs breed together, you get dogs, so there is a dog kind. So they're proposing that the kinds that Noah is told to take are broader than just the species level. Above the species level in the taxonomy, you have a family level. And they're saying, okay, that's approximate what approximates what Noah would have taken. So dogs are members of the family Canidae, and the idea would be that Noah took two proto-dogs, and then after the flood, uh, these developed into wolves and coyotes and jackals and domestic dogs and so forth. And that would bring down the number of animals that Noah needed to take rather significantly if he's only taking representatives of a family rather than a species. Do you think that this is a successful proposal? Uh, 
It's really problematic for several reasons. One of them is that a lot of families are really diverse. Uh, for example, house cats are members of the family Felidae. But you know wh who else is members of Felidae? Leopards and lynxes and pumas and jaguars and lions and tigers. Big cats. Now, Ark Encounter accepts the usher dating of the flood uh, to the 2300s BC, but I find it really hard to believe that species as different as lions or tigers on the one hand and house cats on the other hand diverged from each other only four or five thousand years ago. Certainly that's not what the scientific evidence suggests, which is that the branch of Felidae leading to lions and tigers and the branch leading to house cats diverged 10.8 10 million years ago, not four or 5,000. Now we're starting to look at difficulties connected with the creatures that survived the flood. There are several things we should look at under this heading. What's the first? I'll come back to the genetic evidence because there's more to say there, but first I want to note that we need to consider not only the humans and the land animals that survived the flood. We've been focusing on those so far, but we also need to consider the plants that live on land, the aquatic plants, and the aquatic animals because they all survived the flood too and without being on the ark. What's the issue with the plants that were on the land? Well, the first thing to note is they would have died. Uh, plants don't breathe oxygen, but they do photosynthesize, which requires the right sunlight, temperature, and exposure to carbon dioxide in the air. If you take plants adapted for living on land and put them under water for a year, they die. This causes difficulties if you want to take the biblical text as referring to a global flood. Uh, for example, at the end of the flood narrative, we read, Noah sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth a dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth a dove, and she did not return to him any more. So there was already a live olive tree that the dove got a leaf from. And the second time the dove went out, it apparently found enough food that it didn't need to come back to the ark to get fed. But the olive tree should not have been alive, and the dove should not have found a food source after the land had been underwater for a year. In fact, we'll have a link to an experiment where they tested an olive tree by putting it underwater for a year, and it most definitely died. It was not bearing leaves that a, duck could that a dove could come by and pluck. So, based on the realities of what happens when you put land plants under water, when Noah and his family came out of the ark, they would have been confronted with a landscape filled with dead plants. And they would have begun rotting in a big way once exposed to the air again, if they hadn't already begun rotting, creating an enormous health hazard for Noah's family and the land animals with all the bacteria suddenly growing on the rotting vegetation. Then we need to consider how the plant-based ecosystem got reestablished after the flood. Many plants can grow from seeds within a year, so you could propose that the seeds of those species survived the flood and then germinated once the land was dry again. Yeah, but it takes a whole growing cycle for that to happen, and many plants only grow and ripen at certain times of the year. That creates a big problem for all the animals and how they could have survived in the year after the flood. Uh, Genesis does not give us an indication that Noah brought two years' worth of food, which would only make the storage problem on the ark bigger, or that he kept the animals with him for a year until a new plant ecosystem was beginning to be established so that the animals could forage on their own. 
It especially does not suggest that he brought enough animals for the carnivores to eat until a year or two after the flood, the prey animals had multiplied enough that the carnivores could start eating them. Further, not all plants grow within a year. Some, such as trees, take years to grow and bear fruit. So what are you supposed to do if you're a koala and can only eat eucalyptus leaves, but all the eucalyptus trees are dead? Or what are you supposed to do if you're a fruit bat and you need to wait multiple years for the fruit trees to grow again and start fruiting? There are huge problems here from the reason perspective with the, with the reestablishment of the ecosystem. What about the aquatic plants and animals, the ones designed to live underwater? Wouldn't they have weathered the flood with no problem? You might think so, but no. Uh, aquatic plants and animals are specialized for the type of water that they live in. That's why some of them live in fresh water, like lakes or rivers, and others live in salt water, like in the ocean. They need a certain level of salinity or saltiness in the water, whether it's a high level or a low level. Freshwater plants and animals can't live in the ocean, which is too salty for them. And saltwater plants and animals can't live in ordinary lakes and rivers, which aren't salty enough for them. So what was the salinity level of the Great Flood? All of that water that got added to the world's oceans, whether it came from above or below, was either salty or fresh or somewhere in the middle. And with the water sloshing around and mingling for a year, that salinity level would have averaged out. And that average salinity level, whatever it was, would have been wrong for a bunch of the underwater plants and animals, and it would have killed either the freshwater plants and animals or the saltwater plants and animals or both of them. As a result, we either shouldn't have freshwater plants and animals today or we shouldn't have saltwater ones or we shouldn't have both. Uh, people often don't think about this because they're focused on the animals on the ark, but this is a big problem. Couldn't God have miraculously kept the freshwater and the saltwater apart, making zones for these different creatures to live in? Yeah, he could have, uh, but the biblical text does not suggest this. It doesn't mention anything about it. As a result, you're going beyond the text if you want to propose such miracles. You can do that, but it isn't the evidence available from the reason perspective that's driving your proposal. It's your theological convictions about there being a global flood, not what the scientific evidence would suggest. Let's look back at the land animals then. What evidence do we need to consider here? We've already mentioned two problems from the reason perspective. One is how the animals would have survived after the flood in a world of dead and rotting vegetation. Uh, even if they didn't die from disease, they'd still have to wait a long time, and years in some cases, for there to be food sources for them. We can refer to this as the ecological problem. The other problem we mentioned is that if Noah took only proto-animals from the different zoological families, like proto a proto-cat pair from Felidae and a proto-dog pair from the Canidae family, then we wouldn't expect the kind of animal diversity we see today. We can refer to this as the genetic problem. For example, lions, tigers, and house cats are so different from each other that they wouldn't have diverged only a few thousand years ago. The scientific evidence from the reason perspective is that their most recent common ancestor lived about 10.8 million years ago. And that's something we know based on paleontological and genetic evidence, because we can estimate how long ago two species diverged by how different their DNA is, since it takes time for mutations to accumulate in a genome. So both of these are problems, the ecological problem and the genetic problem, but it turns out there are sequels that we need to consider to both of these. What's the sequel to the ecological problem? How different ecosystems got to different parts of the world. For example, koalas can only eat eucalyptus leaves, and eucalyptus trees are native to Australia. 
So if the ark landed on the mountains of Ararat in the Middle East, how did the eucalyptus trees and the koalas get to Australia? Noah didn't take him there. He didn't do a worldwide ecosystem recovery project traveling all over the globe and planting the right animals, the right plants and animals in different regions. Uh, even if you suppose that eucalyptus trees started growing near the ark in the Middle East so the koalas could eat from them, how did they migrate to Australia and why did they only go there? Why didn't they fan out so that koalas and eucalyptus are found in a bunch of places all over Europe and Asia? And why didn't this happen with every species of animal that got out of the ark? Why didn't they fan out in all directions so that they would be found today in multiple places? I mean, why don't we find marsupials all over Europe um, and Asia and Africa? Why are all the marsupials either in Australia or the Americas? That doesn't make any sense. Could God have guided them there the same way he guided them to the ark in the first place? He could have, but now we're proposing another miracle that isn't mentioned in the Bible. And we need one more because these animals are dependent on other plants and animals in their native ecosystems, and those ecosystems don't exist in the Middle East. So how did they survive the years-long trip to their ultimate destinations? And how did they get to places like Australia, which is surrounded by ocean? I mean, you'd need to posit even more miracles, like God suddenly endowing all the Australian marsupials with the ability to swim, or God miraculously parted the hundreds of miles of water, the hundred miles of water between Australia and Papua New Guinea to let the animals cross it. I mean, God can do that by miracles, but it isn't what the evidence suggests from the reason perspective. So it would be your theological beliefs driving this in order to support a belief in the worldwide flood. You said there's also a sequel to the genetic problem of the diversity we see in different animal families. What's the issue here? It's the genetic diversity we see within single species. Even if you set aside the amount of genetic difference between lions and tigers on the one hand and house cats on the other, we still have to account for the amount of genetic variation within each one of these species. Now, when a species dies, or I should say when most of a species dies and it begins flourishing again, or most of a population dies and begins flourishing again, genetic, geneticists call this a population bottleneck. Um, most of the genetic diversity that was in the original population stops because most of the members of that population died and only a few survivors survive and then begin breeding again for the population to recover. So only the genes that go through that bottleneck are the ones that get passed on when the community starts flourishing again, and they came from only a small number of survivors. So when a population bottleneck occurs, the species becomes much less genetically diverse. And once the population grows in size again, it only slowly accumulates new mutations. As a result, we can use genetic testing to find out things like if a population has gone through a bottleneck and how long ago it was and how many survivors went through the bottleneck. An example would be Noah's family. For a long time, people have wondered how the different races of humanity could have come from just eight people. So what does the scientific evidence say here? There were attempts in the 19th century to explain the different races of humanity by proposing that no, the wives of Noah's sons were of different races, which is a really good argument for interracial marriage, if you think about it. Uh, the 19th century may have had a racist preoccupation with miscegenation or race mixing, but interracial marriage is what would have kept the human family alive on this view. However, after all the genetic testing that's been done in recent years with the mapping of the human genome, this simply isn't what the evidence points to. 
humans have a surprising lack of genetic diversity, and there is evidence that we've been through population bottlenecks, but never just eight people. There's evidence that we may have dwindled down to just 2,000 individuals about 100,000 years ago, but not eight people four or 5,000 years ago. And the problem isn't just humans. If there was a global flood that wiped out everything but two of every land species, we should see a population bottleneck happening in every species of land animal. Four to 5,000 years ago, all of them should have gone through a population bottleneck with just two survivors or 14 survivors in the case of animals that Hebrews considered ritually clean. And we don't see anything like that. The genetic evidence simply is not consistent with every single species of land animal going through such a bottleneck. Now, again, God could do a bunch of miracles to explain the genetic diversity we see today, but that's not what the scientific evidence is pointing to. Then let's summarize the evidence regarding a global flood from the reason perspective. What does it show? When we look at the geological record, we find evidence for an old earth with different species of plants and animals living at different times, leaving their fossils in separate layers, allowing us to reconstruct a history of life from the simplest organisms to more complex ones to the age of the dinosaurs and then to our age. We don't find evidence of all the species of plants and animals living at once and suddenly being wiped out by a global flood that would have jumbled their fossils together. When we look at the ark, its 100,000 square foot floor space is not big enough for Noah to have kept 50,000 animals and all the food they need for a year, especially the food they need for the carnivores. And if you propose he only took f members from each zoological family rather than each species, you'd then have the problem of explaining how lions, tigers, and house cats could have become so different in just a few thousand years when the scientific evidence points to them having a common ancestor basically 11 million years ago. During the year of the flood, the waters would have had a salinity level that would have killed either all the freshwater plants and animals, or all the saltwater plants and animals, or both. Once the ark came to rest, Noah and his family would have emerged into a world full of dead, rotting vegetation posing a grave health hazard. The animals would have starved during the years-long process of the ecosystem coming back online again as the plants started regrowing from seeds. And they should have fanned out from the Middle East and be found in many places around the world instead of some, like marsupials, being localized in places like Australia or the Americas, which were separated by large uncrossable bodies of water. And we should see genetic evidence that every species of land animal went through an extreme population bottleneck within the last few thousand years and we don't. So while God could have done a bunch of miracles to explain these things, it's not what the scientific evidence points to. As a result, the reason perspective strongly suggests that there was not a global flood. If you choose to believe in one, that's fine, but it's your theological convictions telling you there was one, not the scientific evidence. If there wasn't a global flood, could there have been a local one? Absolutely. In fact, there were multiple local floods in the Middle East in the right time frame. The question is whether we can identify one of them as the particular event that serves as the background to the biblical flood narrative. Some have proposed particular local floods, such as the ones that occurred at the end of the last ice age, might be behind the biblical flood narrative, or it might have been one of the floods that occurred more recently than that. But uh, there have been big local floods in the area, including ones that may explain not only the biblical flood story, but also the Mesopotamian flood stories. For example, we'll have a link to an article on the National Center for Science Education website, which concludes, If the 3.4 meter thick layer of flood deposits in southeastern Mesopotamia 
represents a huge flood of ancient times, and if it's the remnants of the one described in the early Babylonian ep epics, then the authors of these epics were likely survivors who lived in a village on natural levees on the lower parts of either the Euphrates or Tigris rivers, where the floodwaters covered their village. Natural levees and adjacent floodplains for distances of 100 to 200 miles so that no land could be seen and their whole world would have been underwater. So it's quite possible that a local flood did inspire these flood narratives, and in a future episode we may look at some of the different proposals for which floods may have inspired the biblical narrative. Does there have to be just one flood that inspired the biblical narrative? Not necessarily. Even today, people sometimes combine different stories to produce an overall narrative. For example, sometimes reporters will interview multiple people and combine them into a single figure in their reporting. When they do this, the resulting figure is said to be a composite of several different figures. Thus, a reporter might interview several people who have been victims of spousal abuse and then combine the elements of what happened to them into a composite figure when they write their story. Or sometimes you'll see movies based on historical events where they use composite characters to keep the cast from being too large. The movie Apollo 13 is an example of that, where they combine several real-life NASA public relations employees into a single employee to keep the audience from getting confused by introducing multiple people doing very similar things. And you can also composite historical events. Like, suppose you were converting to Christianity and had several conversations with someone that helped convince you to be Christian, you might later combine elements of those different conversations into a single conversation when you're writing your conversion story. So it would be a composite of different things that you discussed when you were becoming Christian. Do we see compositing happening in the Bible? We do. If you read Luke's version of the healing of the centurion's servant, you learn that the centurion himself did not come to meet Jesus. Instead, he sent several Jewish people as his representatives to talk to Jesus. But to keep things simpler for his readers, Matthew telescopes those intermediaries into the centurion himself. So in Matthew, the centurion is a composite figure that combines elements of what the centurion and his agents did together. So it's also possible that the biblical flood narrative is a composite reflecting elements of what happened in more than one specific flood. Uh, I haven't heard that proposed, but I mention it for the sake of completeness. What does all this say about Noah as a historical figure? Well, uh, when there have been big floods, there have been people who have survived them under God's protective providence. If there was a single big local flood that's behind the biblical narrative, then Noah would be based on a survivor of that flood. Or if the biblical narrative involves composite elements, then Noah could be a composite based on the survivors of different floods, the way Matthew's centurion is a composite based on several figures mentioned in Luke's more detailed narrative. Either way, there would be a historical reality behind Noah. It's just a question of is it a single figure or is it a composite of several figures. Then let's go for the last question we mentioned at the top of the show. Were there rainbows before whatever flood or floods are behind the biblical narrative? I would say yes, and the Bible doesn't say otherwise. The laws of optics were the same, whatever local flood or floods inspired the biblical narrative, and the effects of sunlight and water vapor in the sky would have produced rainbows. The biblical text also doesn't say that God made rainbows for the first time after the flood. This is something that the Answers in Genesis website points out. Uh, we'll have a link to an article that says, in part, In Genesis 9.13, God said, I do set my bow in the cloud, and God does not imply that he had never set a rainbow in the clouds before, but only that from now on the rainbow, appearing as it so often does, as rain is ending, would henceforth have a special significance as a token or reminder of God's promise to never again send a worldwide flood. So even the answers in Genesis folks don't have a problem with the idea of rainbows before the flood. 
what if you what if you think there were only local floods? It doesn't really affect the situation. Uh, let's look uh, at, back at what the text actually says about the rainbow. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The text says that God has made the rainbow, but he doesn't, it doesn't say he's made it for the first time just now. Uh, periodically in the Bible, you will read about things that already existed, but that are given a new symbolic significance. And that's what's happening here. The rainbow is clearly symbolic because God is omniscient and does not literally need a reminder that he's promised not to wipe out all life with a flood. What the text is really doing is using the rainbow as a sign to mankind that God will not wipe us out with a flood. The text may have visualized the Great Flood as a global one that destroyed mankind, but that appears to be a detail that's not meant to be pressed literally. It helps in this regard to remember what Pope Pius XII said in his 1950 encyclical Humanae Generis, where he discussed the literary genre of the chapters in the first part of Genesis. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, although properly speaking not conforming to the historical method, used by the best Greek and Latin writers, or by competent authors of our time, do nevertheless pertain to history in a true sense, which, however, must be further studied and determined by exegetes. The same chapters, in simple and metaphorical language adapted to the mentality of a people but little cultured, both state the principal truths which are fundamental for our salvation, and also give a popular description of the origin of the human race and the chosen people. So these chapters aren't meant to be historical in the modern sense. They do contain elements from history, like the fact the flood narrative is based on one or more real local floods, but their purpose is to, in simple and metaphorical language, state truths connected to our salvation. What kind of lessons would be involved in this case? This becomes clearer when you study the background of other flood stories in ancient Near Eastern literature. In the Babylonian epics, for example, the flood is caused by mankind making too much noise and keeping the gods awake at night. And then when the gods unleash the flood, they realize they've bitten off more than they can chew and start howling in fear at the sight and sound of the flood. So the gods come off looking foolish, looking like foolish beings that unleash a flood that they can't control for no good reason. By contrast, in the Bible, the flood isn't caused by people keeping God awake at night. It's caused by human sin, and it isn't a wild force that God can't control. It's part of his plan and under his control. Furthermore, even in the midst of disaster, God cares for the righteous, like Noah and his family, and he cares for his creation, like the animals in the ark. And after it's all over, God promises not to let a flood destroy mankind as long as the world lasts. So when you take account for the simple and metaphorical language the text uses to convey spiritual truths based on the historical reality of one or more big local floods, we find truths like God has a good reason for the things he does, nature is under God's control, human sin can lead to suffering, but God loves his creation and the righteous in particular, and he will not let a great flood destroy us in the future. That's what the text is trying to teach us, and while these early chapters in Genesis may be based on historical events, we aren't meant to take some of the details overly literally. One last question before we go. If the flood narrative is based on a single big local flood rather than being a composite, could we actually go and find Noah's Ark somewhere? That's a fascinating question, but this episode is already long, and I'm afraid we'll have to wait until a future episode to evaluate the hunt for Noah's Ark. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Jimmy, what's your bottom line? The evidence from the reason perspective does not support the idea of there having been a global flood. However, there certainly were big local floods, including in the Middle East, and one or more of these is the historical reality behind the biblical flood narrative. 
Similarly, people survived these floods by God's providence, and one or more of these people are the historical reality behind Noah and his family. And while rainbows did occur previously, we have God's assurance that a flood will never destroy mankind. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the viewer and listener? We'll have links to Tremper Longman and John Walton's book, The Lost World of the Flood, Mythology, Theology, and the Deluge Debate. Uh, we'll also have a link to David Montgomery's book, The Rocks Don't Lie, A Geologist Investigates Noah's Flood, and Jerry Blount's book, Noah and the Great Flood, Proof and Effects. And those books come from different perspectives, so you can read more than one side of the de of the debate. We'll also have link to Answers in Genesis's page on six major evidences for the flood, Pius XII's encyclical Humanae Generis, Ken Ham's Ark Encounter page, uh, also the Ark Encounter page on the number of animals, a look at the Paluxy River footprints, also articles on flood stories, flood geology, Noah's Ark, canopy theory from Answers in Genesis, the volume of Earth's oceans, underground and oceans worth of water with that ringwoodite I mentioned, uh, information on the evolution of the Felidae family of cats, information on the feeding of doves, the olive tree experiment I mentioned where they kept an olive tree underwater for a year and it died. Um, also information on population bottlenecks, the National Center for Science Education on local floods, information on rainbows, answers in Genesis on rainbows, and a link to searches for Noah's Ark. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines today? Well, one thing that's been in the news recently is uh, something called the Havana Syndrome. And I've had a bunch of people asking, will we do an episode on the Havana Syndrome? And we may well. I've had it on the big list for a long time. Uh, but since it's in the news right now, I thought I'd give some uh, links to stories people may want to read about it. Basically, Havana Syndrome is a strange condition of, uh, of illness that has been reported particularly among American diplomats, such as those who were serving in Havana, Cuba. And it's been proposed that our colleagues be in behind the Iron Curtain or however you want to say it, our communist counterparts are using perhaps some kind of microwave weapon to, or some kind of directed energy weapon to cause our diplomats to become sick. And so we'll have links to three stories. One of them is a general briefing on what you need to know about Havana syndrome. One of them is an argument that it isn't microwaves, although it might be grasshoppers. And another, that's an argument that it's psychosomatic, which is a very controversial claim, especially among those who, uh, who suffer from it. But uh, until we're able to do a full episode on Havana Syndrome, those should get you started. Excellent. So we would love to hear from you, our viewers and listeners, what are your theories about the Great Flood and the scientific evidence concerning it? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page by sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world. So, Jimmy, what are we going to talk about next time? Next week, we're going to be talking with physicist and parapsychologist Dr. Edwin May and his career with the Stargate Psychic Spying Program. Excellent. Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World Bookstore at MysteriousWorldStore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show, including the ones we mentioned today. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the Mysterious Headlines in our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken. Thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. Once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>